now that it's 25 years since I walked out of that trailer the first time on those cold streets in Philadelphia, and I knew this was like the moment of truth. And they said, Sylvester, are you ready? I said, no, but Rocky is. It almost seems like, like a dream state. And quite often people said, or people will say, God, that must have been incredible. I said, yeah, but I was never there. And now when I sit back and I reflect on it, how, what a, an incredible miracle. Every day, I truly miss that character so much. I tell you, sometimes I could just cry because I'll never have a voice like that again where I can just speak whatever I feel in my heart. Um, that's the one thing I'll always cherish about that character because if I say it, you won't believe it, but when Rocky said it, it was the truth. I used to sit in this little apartment, and it was a room. As a matter of fact, the room was so small, I remember I was able to open up the window and close the door while sitting on the bed at the same time. It was like eight feet by eight feet by nine feet. And, but the one thing about that room, there was really very little distraction. So I would sit there propped up in bed, and I'd go out with my big pen and, and legal pad and just start writing these, these stories. And, and most of them were, were, were very, very trivial. But there was something about the process of unrealized dreams. I was always brought back to this subject because I think it's one of the most enduring subjects and one of the most difficult passages for people to accept that they never were realized in their own lifetime, that they just didn't get that shot. You know, I've been coming in for six years, and six years you've been sticking it to me. I want to know how come. You don't want to know. Yeah, I want to know how come. You want to know. I want to know how. Okay, I'm going to tell you, because you had the talent to become a good fighter, and instead of that, you became a leg breaker to some cheap second-rate loan shark. So living... It's a waste of life. The more I thought about this kind of street-like character that, that just is totally misrepresented by the way he looks physically, just the way he walks down the street was enough to, to say people, oh, dismiss him, he kind of looks like a bully or looks like a dark kind of character. I thought, you know, that's an interesting character because they're always unrealized. Well, that, that, that festered in my mind for quite a while, and then eventually after... Lords of Flatbush, I decided it was a time to come to California. So I went to California, and I moved in the valley, and things weren't going very, very well there. As a matter of fact, I had to go out and try to sell my dog because it was either uh, do that or, or uh, he just was not going to be very well fed around the house. And then one night, I went to see uh, Muhammad Ali fight Chuck Wepner. We want to be free! And what I saw was pretty extraordinary. I saw a man they called the Bayonne Bleeder who didn't have a chance at all against, you know, the greatest fighting machine, supposedly, that ever lived. Body back and slips a punch to his left. Oh, a vicious shot to the rib of Muhammad Ali, and what a surprise. Chuck Webber gets to the body. And for one brief moment, this supposed stumble bump turned out to be magnificent in the fact that he lasted and knocked the champion down. I said, boy, if this isn't a metaphor for life, his entire life crystallized at that moment. He will be remembered for all eternity, at least uh, uh, among the fight fans. He did something extraordinary. I said, now that, that is probably what I need as a catalyst for an idea. A man who's going to stand up to life and take one shot and maybe go the distance. So I started to write. And it was one of those writing frenzies. And three days later, I came up with the script of Rocky. Now, the script by no means was a finished piece of material. It was probably about 90 pages, and maybe 10% of it remained in the final script. But it was done. Originally in Rocky, the film was very, very dark because filmed at that time, the antihero was... I guess, the the favored kind of character of the day. And 
I, I pretty much wrote the original one to be like that. The character was very dark. As a matter of fact, uh, he throws the fight at, at the very end, and Mickey himself turns out to be this very angry, racist man. And and uh, the reason, actually, Rocky throws the fight because he didn't want to be involved in this kind of world. He just he said, you know, I'd rather be who I was and to just have all this hatred around me and so on. I remember showing it to my wife. She goes, oh... I don't like it. Rocky seems so nasty, so this, so that. Because I had made him very, very street-like and, and, and unrepentant. You know, he didn't have the kind of uh, attitude that eventually he ended up with. So I went back and rewrote and rewrote and rewrote. I first met uh, Bob Shardoff and Erwin Winkler, and I believe I was there on, on a, a, a casting call. So we're talking a little bit, and I guess I really wasn't right for the acting part. And on the way out... I said, oh, I don't know if it matters, but I do a little bit of writing. He goes, really? I said, yeah, as I'm writing this, this story, this, uh, I have this thing about wrestlers, and I might do something about boxing. Well, he says, well, bring it around. And I thought, if I hadn't stopped on the way out, you know, that's why I tell all actors or writers, don't give up, keep talking. Eventually, you might hit a nerve somewhere, and they go, ah, come on back. And if they didn't say, come on back, or bring it later and let's see what you've developed, I wouldn't be sitting here. So I have to give incredible credit to their, uh, to their insight and their patience, and they're willing to take a chance, which um, it doesn't exist much anymore, unfortunately. Originally, when I brought the script to them, they were fairly enthusiastic about it. The one thing they were not enthusiastic about was me playing the part, and, and I really can't blame them at the time. Ryan O'Neill was a, a candidate, Burt Reynolds, Robert Redford, Jimmy Kahn, and they all you know, were, were at the top of their game. And so I could see it, but there was something inside of me that, that you know, this opportunity is never going to come around. And I really wasn't used to money, and I had no idea of what I would be missing. But the temptation started to come forward. First it was uh, Twenty-five grand, then a hundred thousand dollars. I go, well, I never heard of a hundred thousand because I had had like a hundred six dollars in the bank, and like I said, I had to sell my dog, and things were not looking very, very good. Uh, my forty-dollar car had just blown up, so I was taking a bus to work, and but still, it it didn't matter. I wanted to stick with it. Then it went up to one hundred fifty thousand, one hundred seventy-five thousand. It went up to two hundred fifty thousand. Now my head was starting to spin, and it went up to three hundred thirty thousand. And probably, I heard it went up to 360000 And I thought, all right, you know, you've really managed poverty very well. You've got this down to a science. You really don't need much to live on. I had, I had like, sort of figured it out. So I was not um, in, in any way uh, used to, to the good life. So I thought, you know what? If I, I know in the back of my mind, if I sell this script and it does very, very well, I'm going to jump off a building and if I'm not in it. There's no doubt about it. I'm going to leap in front of a train. I'm going to be very, very upset. So this is one of those things where you just roll the dice and you fly by the proverbial seat of your pants and say, all right, got to try it. i got to just do it. I may be totally wrong, and I'm going to be taking a lot of people down with me, but I just believe in it. We didn't have really the, the money to shoot a normal Union film at that time in Philadelphia, so we would travel in a van. I would jump out of the van, and uh, we were working with the handheld camera at the time with, with Garrett Brown, and it was uh, ex somewhat experimental. And he'd film me running through shopping malls and up, down, and steps, and flights, uh, I mean, curved corridors along the river until finally my legs basically gave out and I'm like writhing on the ground and I want to <laughs> rise up and say, John, I'm dying here. And he goes, no, no, use it. Use the pain. I said, for what? I mean, I'm in misery. He goes, well, no, no. You know, it, it's giving your character, it's, give, it's giving him some depth. I said, it's giving me bruises. It's giving me like agony. I can't sleep at night. But, you know, John would use, one thing about John, he would use the environment. If he saw like the scene where we just jumped down and saw this ship along the dock, this uh, uh, docked along the pier. And he said, just jump out, run as fast as you can along the ship. And, and, and I'm running and running. I said, you know what? My legs are buckling. I'm, I'm literally going to crash down here. Teeth are going to go, jaw, face. I'm just going to be ground down to this flat-faced image. 
please. And I just barely made it because John had had me, he would have me run and run and jump park benches and down streets and people are throwing things at me. Like when I had the orange thrown at me and I'm, these people had no idea who I was. I was just some strange alien vader in a well-worn, tattered, baggy, <laughs> incredibly <laughs> ugly sweatsuit running through their neighborhood, you know, and they're like throwing things at me. And we kind of like made it work, but I actually was like, I thought they were trying to hit me with the orange. There was a kind of a, a lot of injuries on the set. I remember I was doing uh, running up and down the steps. Originally, I was supposed to run up and down the steps with butt kiss to show how strong Rocky had become. The first time he could barely get up the steps, and then I started picking up the dog. And halfway up the steps, I said, "This is a bad idea." The dog weighed about 135 pounds. I said, "And there's no way I can run gracefully up the steps." More or less, I couldn't even stagger up the steps, so the dog was definitely cut out. But in the meantime, I had gotten a, a wicked case of shin splints, which is an old injury I had gotten from playing high school football. And then when I was hitting the meat, I thought, oh, this would be an interesting visual, hitting the meat. Well, I don't know if anyone's hit a, a bowl lately. They're hard. They're real hard. So all my knuckles were flattened out. They just uh, became, um, I guess, kind of like, um, well, I don't know what they're good for anymore. I guess, you know, kind of like a table leg now. They're, they're pretty flat. They're pretty even. They really don't function as a hand much anymore. But these are all somewhat of the memories of, uh, and, and the broken finger that I was using with Adrian. I said, okay, I'll just like, take all the injuries in the movie and somehow work it in. Also in the movie, there was a, we couldn't afford many people, so I tried to get as much help uh, from from friends, from my brother who plays a street corner singer, and my father who's a bell ringer. I, I said my dog is in it. Even uh, my my wife, my first wife, uh, was the set photographer. But it was she was I think she shot a total of maybe a hundred pictures because the budget was really really tight. And uh, actually, it was probably the best set photographer I've had in a long time because all those pictures are great. Talia Shire was also um, a last-minute choice because we, we just couldn't find the right person. And then she came in, and it was, I think, the same night as Carl Weathers. A very, very... I, I think it was. And she came in, and we just read. And I felt the earth move. I, I really felt a tremendous vitality and kinship. I mean, I loved her. I really, really loved her. I just loved the way she looked and the way she, she her hair fell and, and this timid, fragile creature. I said, it was just incredible and the perfect voice. So when we were going to do uh, Rocky meets her and he, he, he just talks to her and, and, and he sees a beauty in her that no one else sees because everyone has something to do. Rocky really has nothing to do. So he moves at a much slower pace and he observes and he sees things that other people don't see. So he's trying to bring her out because I guess he feels that she's probably the only one who's worse off than he is. So he's feeling kind of like a little protective towards her. And the sequence where we're supposed to go ice skating, originally that was written for 300 extras and it was a big deal. Well, I show up on the set. They said, we have a slight change in plans. We have one extra. I said, interesting. And um, I said, well, I have a, an interesting thing uh, to tell you, too. I don't ice skate. I don't know why I wrote it, but I thought it'd be interesting. So here we are with an empty arena, and uh, I don't really skate at all. So I decided I was going to run on ice, and she really, she says she skates, but if you watch her, her ankles are falling in, and she's barely holding on, and Rocky's trying to explain his life, looking cool, and he looks like so foolish, but she doesn't care. And where they really come together at that moment when he goes, you know, my father said I wasn't born with much of a brain. He goes, uh, my mother, my mother, she says sort of the same thing. He says, you weren't born with much of a body, so you better start developing your brain. It's like... Oh, these two people are two halves that absolutely need to fit together. You know, they are really on the same page. Then he walks her home. I think we make a real sharp couple of coconuts. I'm dumb with you shot. What do you think? And I'm starting to, like, realize that this is the key to the film. This is the heartbeat. The whole, the whole movie is going to be based on the discovery of these two people, the love. She goes upstairs, 
And now she's like terrified because this is not exactly what you call a swinging bachelor apartment. And the moment when he, when he gets her to that, that door, all of a sudden the, the whole facade changes. He no longer looks like this terrifying guy. He goes, you know, would you take off your glasses? And she really looks, if you ever watch that scene closely, you'll never see better responding by an actress to an awakening inside of like really feeling like someone truly loves her, that it's like she's dying. She's never felt this before. And coming from this man who is, you know, this physical kind of specimen, the last kind of guy she ever imagined herself being with, it, it just, I mean, I, I disappear in that scene. She is just off the chart. You want to kiss me back if you don't want And I knew, I said, as soon as I kiss her, I'm going to be in a hospital bed. But it's okay. I knew I was going to have it. He's like, here comes the flu. And anyway, I come together and I kiss her and we go down to the floor. I, I don't know if, if I could ever have a scene that had more love than I'll ever do in it. And even though I got the cold, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm over it, Talia. It's okay. And I couldn't have come up with, with a better, better Apollo Creed than, than Carl Weathers. He was absolutely magnificent on his feet, an amazing body, the perfect voice, and he had this, this bearing that, actually, Carl came in. He was, we were going to use Ken Norton, and Ken Norton goes, well, no, I'm going to go to the ABC Superstar, Superstar competition. It fell out like two nights before. I said, oh, boy. I tell you, I really believe in divine intervention sometimes because he walks in and he starts to audition and he's doing the lines well and then he gets up and he starts to box with me a little bit and he, and he bangs two or three off my head. I said, geez, this guy has... He really doesn't care if he gets the part, does he? I mean, he's like he's putting lumps on my forehead and he's really into it. Then he sits back down and he goes, uh, Mr. Avelson, I could do much better if you had a real actor reading with me. He goes, well, Carl, that's Rocky. That's the guy who wrote the script. He goes, oh, maybe he'll get better. <laughs> you know what? I said, please, hire him. Uh, he's, great. he's great. That's exactly the attitude I wanted. He was fantastic, and he still is. I remember I was taking the ride across country because I couldn't afford an airline flight, and I'm on the train for like three days with the dog Budkiss. And Budkiss at that time had this terrible flatulence problem. He had this gas, and so he was gassing me. He tossed the entire country. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it got to the point where I, I said, Budkiss, one of us has got to go. No one's going to sit in the car with us. I couldn't breathe. I said, I'm trying to concentrate on the character of Rocky. Is this foreshadowing? Is this, man, is this dog telling me exactly how this film is going to come out? A stinker? I don't know. I'll never forget. I was like, the, the train pulls into Arizona, and it's like 4 o'clock in the morning. I said, is it? I got a tour. So I picked up Budkiss in a bear hug and tried to get him to go to the bathroom. And people said, why are you squeezing your dog? I said, you don't understand. It's a matter of survival. And anyway, uh, he didn't. And, and again, it was a, a very, very <clears throat> smelly experience until I got to Philadelphia. And then he gets right to the hotel where I'm staying and decides to let it go and literally built a pyramid. I mean, it was the most unbelievable thing. I said, you know what? This dog has got to be in the movie. There's no question about it. There's somehow, I don't, I don't know what, but the, any dog that can do that has star quality <laughs> or is extraordinary. And that's how Budkiss got in the movie. You know, he, he and I, we kind of like lived together. He was the one that I would bounce ideas of. When I'm sitting there at 3 o'clock in the morning writing, I'd say, what do you think about that? And obviously, he would say nothing, so he's a perfect writing partner. And anyway, that's the story of me and Budkiss. The original ending of Rocky was, 
quite different than what we have now. The original ending was he, he goes the distance and he's looking for Adrian. The crowd is starting to disperse. You know, one minute after the fight, yes, he, he did a noble thing, but time moves on. The, the champion is carried out of the ring and Rocky starts to meander through the crowd. He eventually gets to the curtain. He pulls back the curtain at the back of the arena and sees Adrian. And she gives him a, a slight hug and he picks up this small pennant like a flag and hand in hand they start to walk back to the rock, locker room there's no one talking to him anymore there's just trash strewn everywhere and they just see these two solitary figures moving off into the distance off into like you know being anonymous forevermore but they just had that moment and and the all he could think about was how much he loved her and just getting back to his life again, the real life. And it just didn't seem very, very satisfying. So after we had done that, and that was the poster shot, we thought, boy, wouldn't it be interesting to catch a man's moment, a man's life at the quintessential seminal moment. So we went back and... <laughs> I have friends in the scene. I have producers in the scene. We had about 30 people. We only had the money to do like one quarter of the ring, so just a little corner. And you see these people going around in a circle, middle around, and, and crowds, and Rocky's going, oh, I, you know, just get everything out of my face. He's yelling for Adrian, Rocky, Adrian, Rocky. And they had someone, as as Adrian is running to the ring, again, very, very tight, they had... Uh, like fishing line connected to her hat, and they pull her hat off. So, because I thought, wouldn't it be interesting that the first thing Rocky says when she comes into the ring is like, "Where's your hat?" I mean, he's so into her, into like the way she looks, and that he doesn't care that his eyes are swollen shut, his hands are smashed, and that he's done the greatest thing in his life. He doesn't say, "Look at me." He goes, "Where's your hat?" And he's like, "I love you." He goes, "You know, I love you too." Yeah, I mean. The visual's working, the sound is working, the body movements are all coming together at this absolute peak. And right there, when I embrace her, uh, I was sitting with John Amelson, and he, we froze right on the single frame when he is looking elated, and he has her in his arms, and it's just this look of ecstasy. And the next frame, it went like, uh, it just deflated. I said, there it is. From that moment on, it's all downhill. I mean, how we all hit this absolute maximum of elation and celebration. And, you know, that can only be sustained for, like, oh, just an infinitesimal moment in time. And if you can just can you imagine how, how great it would be just to freeze on that moment. And that's how we froze Rocky, that the original Rocky, he went out at the height. His, his, his life will never be more rewarding or more important or more valid than that second. And it's, it was a very, very difficult thing to do. I've been trying to do it in films ever since, to bring all those three elements together at the exact instant is, um, it, it was like a minor miracle. Rocky, I had no idea, uh, was ever going to have this sort of response. I just thought it was a, some nice footage because of, by the time the movie had done, it was probably about $950,000. It was very, very inexpensive. Many times we had just one take, and that was it. So when the screenings around Hollywood at the time were getting this unusual response that people were actually reacting to the fight as though the fight were happening. I thought, wow, they're really invested in these characters. And, and I was starting to get you know phone calls from very, very celebrated people around town. I said, wow, this could be it. This actually is going to work. Now, you understand? Because I, I really had no true confidence in it because I had no, no film history, no real film knowledge. I was just working from... I guess instinct, and and I was no not a filmmaker, and really not a. This is as as a writer, nothing, nothing had ever been produced before, so I didn't know if my writing really worked. Then finally, it was being shown at the Directors Guild, and this was going to be the test. And there was about nine hundred people invited, and it was a packed crowd, and the movie was playing terribly. 
my mother was sitting next to me, and the laughs weren't coming where they were supposed to, and the fight itself seemed to be listless, the response was, and I sat there as everyone filed out of the theater, and I couldn't believe it. I said, Ma, I really blew it. It was all like, I don't know, it was, it was nice while it lasted, but I guess when you get down and you show it to the big boys, they're just not buying it. Anyway, I sat there and literally there was no one left in the theater because I didn't want, I was humiliated and saddened by the whole thing. And even, you know, I walked her out and I was walking down the steps and there's three flights down, first flight, second flight, and then by the time I turned for the third flight, the entire audience was down there. There was 900 people waiting and they started to applaud. And I mean, truly applaud. And I said, how could you doubt me, Mom? I'm shocked. <laughs> and it's like, I really, I just completely came apart. And there's, there's, so there will never be a moment like that ever. I mean, I truly was over. I said, this is it. I'm just going to you know, go back home, take my dog, and go back into you know, trying to eat out a living. And they were all there. And they responded in a way. It's like, I don't know if that's the way they did things in Hollywood, but they saved it up, and I'll never get over that moment. I just looked at all these people, and they were applauding. And, was, and it's been all downhill since. <laughs> Rocky never expected to win, never. He knew it. He was that much of a realist. And I, I like, admired the character for that because so often I had gone to uh, fight films and or sporting films. Yes, we're going to go out there, we're going to knock him out, you're going to win. I said, no, because I'm not going to win. I'm going to get destroyed. But if I can just be lucid, if I can still be standing on my feet, you know what, then life isn't so bad. And I think, again, symbolically, at the very end of our lives, if we can still say, you know, we were never humbled, we were knocked down, but we got up, and I can say, I lived life with integrity, and I took all the blows, as the song says, and I'm, I still prevailed, I think that's, a, that's a, a good epitaph for anyone. And that's what I tried to capture in this film. But more importantly, I also realized that you can't be alone to really succeed. No man really is an island. And it took the love of a woman that no one else loved. It took even the befriending of, of her brother who no one could understand, but they gelled together. And, and Rocky brought this, this whole group and with Burgess Meredith, and together they were like individual pieces. But together they made a whole entity, a whole person. And, and I think... Personally speaking, that's happened to me too. When, when you find the right components in your life, the right people that gel with you, then you feel as though you, you're invincible. It may be a fallacy, but you at least feel as though you can, you can take all that life has to dish out. Okay, watch this now. Muhammad Ali and Chuck Wepner. Watch Wepner with his right hand where he hits Ali, right by the heart. Just watch for the punch. There's the left hand that sends him back. Now watch this punch. Bang! And it caught Ali by total surprise. Watch it again. Watch it again. Bang! He catches him. Ali turned and cut him just by the ribcage right next to the heart. That can...